My role is to create new laws to protect the earth. My starting point was a universal declaration of earth rights, which then Bolivia took up and ran with. And now I'm dealing with the other side of that, the governance of the earth's right to life. What is it that we do here and now that sends out huge ripples through the annals of time and embeds something that can actually remain in perpetuity to ensure that the very health and well-being of our wider earth community for people and for planets. This isn't a fight for me, it's an invitation to engage with a very different way of understanding law. It's a realignment of law, realigning human law in alignment with higher law. And for me that's very simple, it's premised on one founding principle of first do no harm. So just like in the uh, 20th century during World War I, we had Quakers standing up as conscientious objectors. Now in the 21st century, we're dealing with conscientious protectors, those on the front line who are standing up to speak the truth of the harm that's taking place. We cannot square it with our conscience to allow that harm to continue, and therefore we stand up as conscientious protectors. Your right to life means nothing if you're standing uh, up a hillside saying, I have the right to life, I have the right to freedom of assembly, you know, free speech, what have you, and someone comes along and shoots you. It means nothing unless your right to life is governed and protected by the criminality of it. There's actually missing law there. Uh, those earth protectors that are standing up and speaking out are the ones that are being arrested and criminalised. Whereas actually those that are causing the harm, the dangerous industrial activity, the, the CEOs, the directors, and indeed the ministers who are signing off and complicit within that harm are not being held to account because the actual harm itself is not identified as a crime yet, as an ecocide. So, until we actually have ecocide recognised as an international crime and there is enforcement for it there, that narrative of rights uh, often lands on deaf ears. And indeed we see that many, many times right across the world, the indigenous world standing up as earth defenders, water defenders, what have you, and yet their rights are completely trampled upon, metaphorically as well as, well as physically, by big industrial activity coming in and destroying their, their patch of land, their territory, their land, their water, being polluted, being destroyed. So it's the enforcement mechanism, the governance of that, that really makes a huge difference here. The easiest way to explain this, because it's often not understood in law, is if you imagine a, a, a governance pyramid. And at the very top of that pyramid, we have justice. And justice is put in place when we criminalise that which is wrong. And that's, that's a moral wrong. Uh, we have a phrase in law when malum in se becomes malum prohibita. When something is so wrong in and of itself, we prohibit it. And that's then when we recognise that it has to be outlawed. At the moment it is lawful to cause significant harm to the earth, extensive damage and destruction. But once we outlaw that and recognise it as an international crime, then you fundamentally shift normatives just because it's a normative today and it's legal to cause serious harm under the auspices of dangerous industrial activity doesn't mean that it's right. At the moment what we're finding is within that governance pyramid at the very bottom we have soft law. If you look at, for instance, the Paris Agreement, when a head of state pulls out of that, it protects nobody. So President Trump pulls out, there's nothing that can be done about that because it's soft law, there's no, no enforcement mechanism. In the second tier of that pyramid, we're dealing with civil litigation, which is when individuals, communities try to sue big transnational corporations or governments. And indeed, at the moment, we have over 800 cases to do with environmental harm, pollution or clim uh, climate change going through the courts right across the world. Not one of them is stopping the dangerous industrial activity. That's because it's, it's the second tier of governance. And that is fundamentally not understood by civil society at large today. But you know what? Big transnational corporations really understand that. 
They really understand that they can continue no matter what. If you want to make lots of profit out of something that causes harm, you are being advised by lawyers like me as to what you can do and what the consequences are if someone tries to chase you. Now, imagine if you're a CEO and you're sitting there for a fracking company or a mining company and you turn around to the lawyer and say, look, can we continue with fracking? I, as a lawyer, can say, in law, yes, you can, because it's, it's lawful. I, can we pollute the waterways? Well, you're not supposed to. Well, what happens if we do? Well, the community are going to have to take action against you, but you know, hey, you can stretch that out to 10 years and you may have to pay a fine. Well, if that CEO wants to continue on, it'll just be factored in as an externality. It's not enough to allow companies to factor it in as an externality. Ultimately, who is protected there is the company or the government. What's still missing is the state duty to act on behalf of the community that's been harmed. I'll give you an example to explain that. You walk into a pub and someone hits you over the head with uh, a beer bottle. It knocks you unconscious. You end up in hospital with brain damage. That's grievous bodily harm. And the state will then prosecute that individual for that. You as an individual in your community do not have to sue that individual for the harm that's been caused. The state protects you and takes action on your behalf for what's happened. The big difference here that we have in terms of enforcement for river rights, for instance, in New Zealand, is that it's the community that has to take that action. The state is not stepping in to prosecute the company that's causing the pollution to the river. And indeed, if the suing is, is going to occur, it's the company that will be sued, not the individuals. And if it's the company that's being sued, then the remedy is very limited. It tends to be a fine. It's only when you take it up to the top tier, when you're dealing with justice and you criminalise that harm, that the enforcement mechanisms can be put in place that fundamentally changes everything on a, on a pinhead, if you will it suddenly stops that which is causing the harm and reframes it uh, as illegal. And that's very important because then once it's made a crime, the state has a legal duty to act on the behalf of its public to safeguard and protect its health and well-being. And not just the public, but the ecology of society and the earth itself. So this is very powerful. What we have here is a missing law, which can then give the enforcement to those earth rights. In fact, what it does is it takes it away from a rights-based narrative to a duty of care-based narrative. In terms of taking ecocide law forward, what this requires is very simple, it's very straightforward. It's, it's an amendment to the Rome Statute, which is the governing document for the International Criminal Court. There are 123 countries that are signatories, so they uphold existing international crime, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. If you put in place international crime of ecocide, all those countries that are signatories to the Rome Statute then impose it in national legislation and will be required to do that, so that automatically it becomes an international crime. And applying universal jurisdiction principles, what it means is that that enforcement can be used even if it's not happening in your country and it's happening in another country that doesn't even recognise that. the tiny little countries around the equatorial belt, they're at the front line of climate change. There is a direct correlation between ecological ecocide and climate ecocide. Dangerous industrial activity, burning off fossil fuels, extracting fossil fuels for instance, contributes to climate instability which gives uh, rise to rising sea level tsunamis and floods. I'm working with not just one but a number of small island developing states that can take forward the proposal of ecocide as an international crime into the International Criminal Court. They have the legal standing to do that. Petitions don't. And yet, these tiny small island developing states have one thing that prevents them from taking this law forward, and that's finance. For them to even to get a seat at the table requires them to actually 
pay to take delegates to New York or to The Hague. And we're doing something that's absolutely unprecedented. It's never been done before in the world, where we're inviting you to become an Earth Protector in law. You can sign up under the Earth Protectors Trust Fund document, legally become an Earth Trustee. And that document has been what's known as apostilled, legalized in every jurisdiction, almost every jurisdiction in the world, so that then you can help fund those small island developing states that are committed to take this forward. It's enabled me last year to take a, a team of lawyers and experts into the United Nations, into the Assembly of State Parties to make representations. And indeed we'll be doing this this year and we'll be doing it bigger and better and more resourced every year until this is put in place. Once that's proposed, everything changes because actually it sends out huge messaging into the world. I mean, look at it this way. For instance, the insurance industry will no longer want to ensure dangerous industrial activity that ultimately is going to be criminalised. The investment world, it's not a matter of it being voluntary divestment out of fossil fuel extractive processes, it will become mandatory. I, banking, you know, the, the world of finance will no longer put investment into any dangerous industrial activity that can trigger and cause an ecocide. If there is no accountability at not just a corporate level, but also a state level, where you're actually holding to account the ministers that are granting the permits, the prime minister that's signing off on this, um, the CEOs and the directors of those companies, if they are not held to account in a criminal court of law, because it is unlawful and it's a crime to do that, it will never stop. We've got the draft law to put in place and that's very powerful because this can effect great change within our lifetimes for the whole of the history of humanity as we move forward. Now that sounds like a huge call to make and it sounds like you know the rebel alliance, legal alliance against the empire and indeed that's what it is. And this is an invitation really to those rebels out there to come together in an unlikely alliance. Maybe a few good funders that can really help finance those states to take this forward. It is a key turner. It is something that we do know we can move very, very fast with. If that was to be proposed in this year or next year, it would be just a matter of years, a couple of years, two to three years maximum, that this would be enforced and in place as an international crime. It's also about what is required now to meet the state of emergency that we're now facing. This is about those of us who care. If you care about this, then I invite you to come become an Earth Protector, sign up, gift funds into this, and the faster we build that pot, the faster we can run. Because ultimately this is about harnessing the power of life safeguarding the power of life. And it's actually, it's about the life of the earth itself. This is the legacy issue. Uh, uh, what we choose to do with our life, where we choose to put our money. You know, it's unprecedented that actually civil society and individuals come together to help finance the law that we require to have put in place. But that's what big business does. It finances the law it wants putting in place to allow it to continue with the dangerous industrial extractive processes. So let's flip that normative. Let's take the power into our hands so that we put forward what it is that we require so that we can safeguard not just humanity but the earth for future generations.